Rather than ask her, where is the mambo sauce? She looked at me all as if I just threw her off What the is that? I said, you know the red sauce Now I'm a DC representer and we known for that swing But I didn't know the sauce was just a DC thing We order chicken with the mambo sauce, the fries with the mambo sauce They never use it now, I got a side of it Uncle Joe is coming through the hood, sometimes when they get lost And people asking me, what I brought this mambo sauce We order chicken with the mambo sauce, the fries with the mambo sauce They never use it now, I got a side of it Uncle Joe is coming through the hood, sometimes when they get lost Carryouts and DC got the same old names, but if you taste the mambo sauce, it's never tasting the same. It tastes better on the fries. I'm from the flavor side. Trust me, you can find it at the nearest Dumb's Georgia's Electors. I got caught on the back of the bus with the pay food and spilled a cup of sauce off of swerving on the A2. A brother got kicked off the driver with bus because he can smell the mambo sauce from the front of the bus. But I got the answer, not for the cure of the cancer. The way to make the sauce is sugar, water, and ketchup with the hot sauce in it. Throw a fork in it and mix it up on the Chicken to you like your jaw with it on the DC scenery. You'll be often seeing me posted up at Spicy's with diabolical eatery. I got the sandwich, sir. Then he got the steak and cheese. But the brother with the more food and the sauce is my beef. the chicken with the mobile sauce, the fries with the mobile sauce. They never use enough. I got a side of it. Uncle Joe is coming through the hood. Sometimes when they get lost, they keep on asking me. Where I put the mobile sauce? the chicken with the mobile sauce, the fries with the mobile sauce. They never use enough. I got a side of it. Uncle Joe is coming through the hood. Sometimes I'm throwing up for the Ho Chi The carry out slash gas station That's Andes I treat my sauce like my Kool-Aid So don't touch it please And all the free low And can't stay away from me So I'm throwing up for the Ho Chi The carry out slash gas station That's Andes I treat my sauce like my Kool-Aid So don't touch it please And all the free low And cats can stay away from me And yo Chicken with the mobile sauce Fries with the mobile sauce They never use enough I got a side of it Uncle Joe is coming through the hood Sometimes when they get lost They keep on asking Yay! Let's give it up for Chris Styles. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to your Anacostia Community Museum. Greetings. We're excited to have you back with us virtually for our final Stories for Change program. My name is Sage Morgan Hubbard, and I'm a mother, an artist, poet, educator, curator, engaged scholar, and organizer. I'm also a contractor with the museum's education department, working on programming for our Food for the People exhibit that you really should check out now. It's worth it, please. <laughs> um, so this is our year for food justice at the Anacostia Community Museum. We've decided on that theme and exhibition um, years ago, long before the pandemic, when equity, food, and food workers were shown to everyone as essential and on the front line. See, all people and cultures tell stories. Our museum exhibitions are all about stories, how and what we eat, how we cook it, how we get our food, everything has stories behind it. And telling these often untold stories from often unheard people can make a difference. This is one of the most universal forms of human connection and the most transformative and impactful. That's why we are so delighted to introduce you tonight to our Stories for Change series, starting off with this food edition, where we have seven local homegrown storytellers, many of whom this was their first time telling stories on a stage and connected to our Food for the People eating and activism in Greater Washington exhibition. That's now on view both inside and outside our, ex our museum. So we're going to share two fresh new stories with you and storytellers, and then you're going to hear from them about why food matters. Our theme tonight is food assistance resistance, relating to our section in our exhibit entitled, Is Food a Human Right? The government, local communities, and nonprofits have all worked to improve food access in America. But the question of who is ultimately responsible for ensuring no one goes hungry is still hotly debated. So in our exhibition, there, we have a section that talks about that the federal government created our most widely known food programs like food stamps, school lunch, government cheese, to seemingly help those in need, but often the benefit of farmers and large food industries instead. Along the way, poor mothers, school children, civil rights activism, and people experiencing 
homelessness, chronic illness, had to fight for making these policies work for everyone and working for them. They developed alternative strategies for feeding their communities and argued that food should be a human right. We're about to hear from two people who have experienced federal assistance and their complicated stories associated with it. So without further ado and me talking too much, I'm going to give a little bio of Wilma Consul. See, Wilma is a journalist, a chef, an artist, a dancer. She's currently teaching culinary arts in D.C. and the, her class is joining us right now. So we're very excited about that. Um, she was born in Manila and has lived in San Francisco and New York. She's also an artist and loves to dance. She does hula, Afro-Haitian, Afro-Cuban, um, and indigenous Filipino dancers. You can follow her at Wilma Consul and check out some of her amazing NPR stories, such as the NPR Hot Part, entitled, This Filipino Dish is So Good It Might Make You Sing. Um, so let's play her video now. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So first off, I posted about this on Facebook. <laughs> so the first time I got food stamp, I just graduated from Columbia University. Journalism. I wanted to go to the best journalism school. But unlike my classmates who were rich and some whose parents paid for the $6,000 expenses for the whole year, I did not come from money. So I got loans to pay for my living and tuition. I was so broke for graduation that I would split a $5 shrimp fried rice with my classmate from Ollie's, from the Chinese restaurant across the street from school. And at that time, I was a meat eater, so it was a big sacrifice for me to have shrimp, right? <laughs> and then Subway tokens, in those days they were tokens, $1.50. That's a lot for me, so I just walk. I did a lot of walking in my life when I was in New York. Then one day, a classmate, a daughter of a prominent journalist, told me, girl, you can get food stamps. She said and she went on about how she and another classmate got there sent from Harlem. It didn't seem like a big deal to them, but it was for me. You see, my family has always struggled when it comes to money. My mother, we call her Nanai, she was a single mother who had four children. She raised the four of us since my father died at the age of 36. I was five years old. My nephew right here, who's visiting from California, his dad, my youngest brother, was about a year and a half old. My mother was a midwife in the Philippines. And when she came to the Bay Area, she became a potato chip packer in Oakland. So. She borrowed a lot of money, not from institutions, but from people in the Philippines. Then one day she decided, I'm going to get married. So she got remarried to a Filipino U.S. citizen, first as a fake marriage, just to get us over here. You've heard of those, right? But he was so nice, we didn't have to pay. <laughs> it was a distant relative. But then they fell in love, so it became real. But then 10 years later, they divorced. And so by the time I was in college, we were on our own again. So when I went, finally got the courage to call the food stamp office, it was in a what we call the reporter room. And we could call for free. 
and all the other students were there. I kept my voice really low. I was so ashamed, and I was nervous. I called, and when I hung up, I cried. I thought food stamps was just for poor people. How could I be poor? I just graduated from the most expensive university in the world. When I went to Columbia University, I wanted to go not just for me, but for my community. I was an activist. I was discovering myself as an artist. My mother asked, why are you going? We don't have any money. And I was a little defiant. I got angry. And I said, do you know how many Filipinos get into that school? But I understand now that my mother was just afraid for me. You see, money did not come and go in our house. We always struggled. Now, I'm not going to tell you when I graduated, because that'll just age me. <laughs> but I can tell you that food stamp in those days looked like monopoly money in a booklet. <laughs> they looked like cash. And you'd tear them, and you give it. So by this time, I was living in Brooklyn on Fifth Avenue before it got gentrified and very expensive now. I was living with a San Francisco friend in a one-bedroom apartment. He slept in the bedroom. I slept in the living room on a mattress. We found somewhere $175 a month. I was living the New York life. <laughs> we didn't have Whole Foods. Trader Joe's, not even Safeway in my neighborhood. We had little grocery stores. It's kind of scary at night. Homeboys hanging out, and uh, they're hanging out at this Italian restaurant where we thought mafia would hang out. But then when I would go to the store, I'd try to make sure no one was there around. But then when there's a lot of people, it kind of sucked, because then I have to bust out my booklet Try to kind of be slick with it, even though everybody was looking. So I don't know how I did it, because everybody's looking anyway. By December that year, I went home back to San Francisco. And um, at the airport, found out my grandfather just died and ended up getting a job back in San Francisco as an assistant editor of Filipinas Magazine. It was just starting out then. And so I stopped being a New Yorker. I never went back to New York. And I forgot about the food stamps. Then in 1999, I came back here to Washington, DC to work for National Public Radio, now NPR. Only supposed to be for three months, but then I decided to try my luck out here. And I got a full-time producer position. I worked that for six years and then left to do my job, full-time reporting, covering this region for WETA-FM on a show called The Intersections. But six months later, they canceled the show. So I was jobless once again. But this time, with new mortgage in my house in Ward 7, car payment, a basement that got flooded and molded and needed repair, and a very expensive Cobra. But so the severance went pretty fast. But I did one thing well with that severance. I went to culinary school because I wanted to be a knowledgeable food writer, right? At the unemployment office, they told me, you know you can get Medicare and emergency food stamp. I said, what? So before I left, I have insurance and I had food stamp once again. But this time, it's no longer paper money. It was a card, a debit card. They called EBT. And that's when the government puts money in the card, and you just use it like a credit card. It's pretty cool, right? So I thought, no shame in this. That's cool. And so I thought, right? In my Ward 7 and Safeway, it's no problem, because I see a lot of people. I felt comfortable using then when I go to other places, I still feel like, man, you know, this is kind of weird. And then sometimes you will run out, and you will have to use your 
debit card or pay cash. So, but this time, you know, I had a different mindset. I said, I had been working since I was 16 years old. I had been paying taxes since I've been working. So I should not feel guilty or ashamed about this. SNAP, by the way, means Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This time, I just need help. I needed the help, and just like what it says, I needed supplemental assistance. So I started shopping at Whole Foods, at Trader Joe's, at Mom's, and I said, can't I have the same food as those who can afford whole, healthy, organic food? I can do that. I deserve that. I worked hard. And I also started telling my aging, starving artist friends who've been really struggling to apply for food stamp and not be ashamed about it because we deserve it. So two years ago, I became debt free. I'm no longer on food stamp. And by the way, this is after 10 years of freelancing that in one year, I had eight W-9s. People told me, are you Jamaican? I didn't understand that. If you know, they apparently someone told me Jamaicans used to have eight jobs or something like that. My Jamaica, I said, I go, why are they calling me Jamaican? Um, so apparently it's a joke. But I did have eight jobs at one point. Um, I was a Zumba instructor here, one of the places here. I was a hula teacher. I was a cook. I was a server. I did everything. And I continued working for NPR uh, because one hour at NPR is three hours in the kitchen. So today, I am a chef instructor at Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School. I teach adult immigrants and African Americans in culinary arts. I also still dabble in journalism on a podcast, and I still do a little bit of hula and Zumba. With that food stamp, when I did that before, one thing that I liked is like when I would go home to my family in San Francisco, I would get to make them a meal from my food stamp, what I could afford, instead of taking them out to a restaurant. And, and I, that's one thing that I liked about that. Um, Today, as a chef instructor, I also work as a personal chef assistant and as, oh, as a personal chef. And with that, I volunteer at my church. Last Saturday, I cooked for the homeless. My nephew helped out, uh, three sisters. And when I cook for the homeless, I don't want to make it feel like they're just getting leftovers. I try to make it feel special the way I wanted to feel when I was on food stamp, right? that I, you know, you don't have to feel shame or guilt about it. I also worked for a, um, a youth arts yoga camp. And I would cook just vegan and vegetarian meals, uh, sort of a non-violence eating. That's, that's what, the, for teenagers. And I enjoy giving food. I'm Filipino, it's natural, it's culture for us to give food. So even if people say, I'm eating too much, I don't want it, I continue to give. That's just part of me. I never thought that I would be a chef in ever in my life after being a journalist and artist for so many years. But I know that it's not an accident. And I'm so OK with that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So we, we're going to bring Wilma up. Um, and I first want to thank you, Wilma, for telling this brave story. And as you can see, Wilma is in the classroom right now, which is awesome. And I've known you for a while and think of you as a really natural storyteller and dancer. But this is the one of the first times I've seen you actually share your story on stage. And you started off by saying, I did not post this on Facebook. Could you talk more about that and how it felt to share such a personal story? Story and why you think there might be so much stigma about food stamps and how we can get over that stigma. As uh, first of all, thank you everyone. Um, and I wanna thank my students for 
backing me up tonight because I've been pretty nervous all, all evening to, to see myself doing that. Um, but food stamp was really a big, you know, there's a big shame about it for me. Um, and the fact that I'm this supposedly, I have a college degree, I graduate, I have a master's, I drive a car, how could I be on food stamp, right? But um, people didn't know that you struggle a lot. You don't get paid a lot and every, I live paycheck to paycheck. And it took a long time for me to really be okay with accepting the help. And maybe part of it is cultural. You do it on your own. I've done things on my own pretty much all my life. That's why it was a struggle. I could have borrowed money and this and that, but I, I tried to do it on my own and you just work hard. That's just, that's just how I grew up. That's culture, you know? And also there's a part of me that I didn't want to burden my family. Yeah. And I, I was wondering, are there other ways, like, I think this is such an important topic that you're getting into of like, that we can put all this money into school in this country and we don't have free schooling. Um, and you went to Columbia University's expensive school of journalism and um, still like couldn't afford to pay the bills. Are there any other examples and ways that you've been able to come out about socioeconomic class and um, and your life has this kind of opened up some more for well, you? Well, you know, even in, in when I was going to get my bachelor's, again, I didn't, I didn't know that parents paid for, for, for college tuition. Um, I just kind of did it on my own. I was working at Sears. And I remember also in, in college, I didn't have enough money. The Pell Grant, I applied for these grants, but sometimes the checks will be late. So... Luckily, I had friends who can afford, and it was a big shame to say, can I borrow? In those days, guys, it was only $375 for a semester at a university. But even at that, for me, that was big money. And when the check came, then I paid them. Again, I didn't ask money from my family, right? I always kind of want to do things on my own. So that's, that's what I did. And when... I would borrow money from credit cards. I learned very quickly the 0% rates. Those things are very useful. You kind of just roll the credit card and you know you use this to pay this. I paid this with mortgage until you can get enough. And it's, it's tiring. It's just been pretty much like that. So that $200 that you would get for food, that's one thing that, okay, that's one thing I don't have to worry about. Right, so that really helped out a lot. And I'm a single woman. I imagine people with families that this would really be more helpful, right? Um, but in the end, all it is really is like, you, you gotta work hard, right? You have to work hard and get yourself out of that. And there's an issue too that whether, you know, underlying all that, the layer of discrimination, if people, do not get promoted for certain reasons, that means your income is not going high, right? Education in the community, no one ever told me, you need to buy a house as an investment, you need to save money. I didn't grow up like that. Yeah. Now I know I'm telling this to my, my nephew, my nieces, so that at least there's some education because clearly I did not have that and I had to learn in my adult life, how I can invest in myself, right? Especially as a single woman, I have to do it on my own. Yeah. I really love that you also talked about the evolution of food stamps from the paper monopoly money to the EBT debit card and the difference of using it in your local Ward 7 with SNAP um, and, and Hold Foods. Um, and that now you've transformed and are inspired and not um, also getting others to use it and especially other artists and not be ashamed. Do you think that the SNAP program as a whole is effective or how would you change the program if you could? 
I think that maybe it depends on, it's probably doing this. I didn't know because I'm just single person, right? But I don't know if they do this. I mean, Misty might answer like if, if you have dependents, mm -hmm. if it gets, you know, if you get a larger amount on that. Um, I think that the switch to the card was a really good idea and took out a lot of that shame. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that's just that's just one thing for me. How would I change it? Uh, well, I heard now too that there's some restrictions. There were restrictions before where you could go what you cannot buy and this and, you know, and I understand that, you know, um, people, you don't want to take advantage of this. This is really for food and for, um, for your own nutrition and, and health. I love the fact that when I go to the farmer's market, they double, you know, they give you a credit. So your money's worth double and you're supporting farmers and getting healthy food and things like that. Yeah, that's wonderful. You also spoke a lot about um, cooking as a way of healing and, and your Filipina ancestry and even the work with nonviolence, um, youth at the arts yoga camp and homeless people and all that stuff. Could you talk about your work in multiple ethnic communities through dance and culinary and why it's important for indigenous and people of color to embrace our food cultures and create our own businesses? As I said, it, it, when I told my story, I never thought that I'd ever be a chef. Mm -hmm. I grew up cooking because I had to cook for my family because my sister went to school, my brother, and you know we didn't have maids. So I was the one left at home to cook. Um, when I came to the States, of course, my life became Americanized, whatever that means, right? A lot of uh, immigrants, you know, you lose the, you don't sit down to dinner at dinner all together anymore because everyone has different schedules. Uh, but my involvement with the Filipino American theater group in San Francisco helped me become more Filipino than I probably would have been if I were in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot more about my indigenous cultures and also going to San Francisco State University where there's a school of ethnic studies uh, that I'm able to learn about the different cultures in this country and about the racial dynamics. And, you know, living in different parts of, of this country. And for me, I think I would just get bored if I ate just one kind of food, mm. you know? Food is history. You can learn a lot about food. Why are we eating, you know, things like our dinuguan, the pig blood stew, which is, a, which is basically like the chitlins, right? Why? Because that's what we got as, you know, we were colonized by Spaniards. The masters got the great part of the animal, right? Yeah. We get the innards, everything like that. And all these spices, because you can't eat it, there's a certain taste to it. So you have to put all these spices yeah. and whatever you do, there's always got to be love with that. And we're a community of people, no matter what. So all that, you know, you, you can learn a lot how certain spices get from here to there. They look a lot. It's because people traveled. Food is history. You can learn a lot about a culture, a group of people, if you look at their food the different spices, the different influences that came in there. As a Filipino or Filipina, our food is a mixture, really. All the things that are meat, right? And it's like, I, I teach a lot of Latinos and it's very much like the Latino food, right? Because we were all colonized by Spaniards. A lot of tomato sauces, you know, red bell pepper, meat. And then if you look at the regional ones, the dried fish, the vegetables, not much in there. You fry it, you dry it, you salt it as preservation because that's basically who lived on the sea, you know, by the sea. And that's how you preserve. And whatever's living around you, you eat what's in your environment. And I think like, you know, DC now has changed. It has become really more cosmopolitan. 
Our downtown used to just be basically, you come here, it's pretty much steaks, right? And cigar places. Now you can go places. And I know some people have not even gone out of DC and there's a lot of things that you, in Maryland and in Virginia, the Vietnamese food, the Korean food. And what I try to do is to educate by what I know. So yesterday, this week, uh, our school, we changed our program and we decolonized yes. our curriculum That's so that the French tradition is not the only thing that we'll follow. We are using French techniques, right? Mm -hmm. We say mise en place and we use batonet and julienne, yet we're making chop che. That's what with the Korean noodle dish, right? Yeah. And so you can use what you know to educate people and it's great. So I'm actually very happy because mm -hmm. even the food service, they liked it. They wanna make it for the cafeteria next week. And awesome. what I love as a chef instructor or even if I'm not teaching, when I introduce food to people, to flavors that they don't know when they're open, it opens up a whole new world and you get to know about people and culture and your community because our community is very rich. Yep. So on that tip, um, could you shout out some of your favorite food places in the DC area, restaurants, <laughs> vendors, grocery stores, anything? Well, I like to go to, um, for the quote, ethnic food or something like that. Um, I like to go to Virginia, right? Arlington, uh, for Thai food and uh, the Vietnamese food. Maryland has a lot. I hardly go on that side, but here in DC uh, by Union Market, I like it. I like it there as well. I know it's gentrified that there's a lot of history in there, but they made one building the La Cosecha, which means the harvest and all that is all Latino businesses, Latino food, Salvadoreño, uh, there's Venezuelan, uh, Peruvian. Okay, they're shouting out Peruvian. <laughs> Mexican now, Las Emelas, and El Cielo, which is Colombian. So all kinds of things in there. And um, basically that's it. I used to love busboys and poets in those days, right? But I, I, I don't go to a lot of places these days because of my work. And yeah. you know, if I can cook it, I try not to get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would love to, um, I know we're running out of time, but one last question is now that I, we can see your students and they're already like, but how you are you modeling um, bravery and storytelling and, and what right now, and what would you like them to um, do and tell their own stories about their lives and relationship to food? Well, first of all, I think, I hope that um, when I said to, you know, to them the other day that I'm going to do this and, you know, some said, I'd like, I'm interested because, you know, I also go through that, right? So again, I never said this, you know, it's kind of scary. That's why I'm very nervous. They sent me, I've said, I kept going to the restroom, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, because I'm telling a story that I've never really told before. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was shame, even even posting it on Facebook. I didn't talk about what I was talking about. Yeah. So, but I hope that it gives them courage. And also that, you know, this is the only way we also can change things. When we tell our stories, people can listen. And hopefully the lawmakers, right? If we don't say, if we don't ask, we might not know, it might not be given to us. We have to ask. We have to be the advocate for ourselves. Yep. Well, thank you, Wilma. That was a perfect ending. I so appreciate. Um, and so I put your, I guess people can follow you on um, <laughs> Instagram a little bit and just, um, I guess, go to Carlos Rosario. At, at, at Instagram, I, I don't, I'm not very good with social media except Facebook, okay. but that's, um, but on Instagram, it's the Citizen Cook DC. That's the name of my small business that I work on when I have time. <laughs> cool. Okay. 
perfect. Thank you so much, Wilma. And I am going to go keep the spirit and energy going to our and introduce our next interviewer um, and storyteller, who is Misty Wilson. She's a therapist, activist, organizer, co-founder of Youth in Action, and one of the first graduates of the Mass Met um, High School in Providence, Rhode Island. She has a BA from Brown University and an MSW from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. She's the mother of two exceptional sons and is starting her own private therapy practice. You can reach her at LinkedIn, which I'll put in the chat, as well at um, Misty Wilson 82 on Instagram or HWB podcast, which is the where she is the co founder, host, and producer of the Healing While Black podcast. Um, so I will put that in the chat and we're going to just have her um, share her story now and then we'll do some interviewing. So as Phil said, I am a therapist, mental health provider, and I work primarily with low-income uh, folks of color. I love my work. It's really special work. And I think I love it most because I get to work with folks who I can connect with, whose struggles are similar to mine. I also love it because there's a measure of control that I have over my schedule. Um, so, you know, during my therapy, sessions or right in between them, I try to schedule these these little breaks of time for self-care. Well, they're supposed to be for self-care, but for me, what self-care looks like is running errands and, you know, doing things like going to the grocery store. Um, and for some reason, I am always in the grocery store. Always. Right? Like, multiple times a week, somehow. And I think that's because I'm also a mom. I have two incredible sons. Um, they're both teenage boys. <laughs> Very blessed. But they eat so damn much. <laughs> so, and the thing is that they, they eat so much. They like to eat the food, but they don't like to come shopping with me, right? You know, so they, they tell me, well, you, you take too long. It's always this big process. So I end up going to the grocery store on my own. I guess I can, I can understand a little bit of, you know, their, their concerns with me um, and why they don't want to go to the grocery store. I, I have this kind of subconscious process where, you know, I'll be in the, the grocery store, you know, adding things to my cart, and I'll, you know, I like to kind of estimate how much things cost along the way, right? You know, other folks do that, right, too, you know, or you want to make sure you have enough money, right, for the things that you're getting in your grocery store, right? So... You know, I add the kale, add the carrots, add the tomatoes. Okay, so that's four, that's three, that's three. Okay, so that's, that's ten, right? Okay, so I'm, you know, counting, and then I add some more things, and I count. You know, of course, you know, I always lose my count as well, so I'm constantly, like, counting, you know. Um, and so I get why my boys are frustrated with going into the store with me. This, this can take a little bit of time. Um, it also never occurred to me, though, how much, how, how funny this must look to the folks that are, the other folks that are in the grocery store, right? You know, looking at me, look down for long periods of time in my grocery cart. Um, and so one day I was at the store and, um, you know, during one of my little breaks, my self-care breaks and doing my count. And uh, a woman comes up to me. I think she thought that I must have been indecisive about some organic bananas that I had in my hand. Um, and so she comes up to me and she asks, um, well, I, I heard that uh, with bananas, it, it doesn't really matter if they're organic or not because of the, um, uh, because of the, um, what, the things on the outsides. I'm like, the peels? She's like, yeah, the peels. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she's like, um, you know, the, the, the peels of the bananas um, you know, they, they help to protect all the things from, from the, the pesticides. And so I'm like, oh, thank you, you know, my most kind of 
sweetest professional voice. Thank you. I, you know, I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, but of course, as she walks away, I'm like, damn it, you messed up my count. <laughs> so anyway, time's moving by, you know, um, and I, you know, I'm ready to check out after about 10 to 15 times of doing a count. Um, and my, you know, my radar comes on. I'm about, you know, scoping out the cashier scene a little bit. You know, I'm also being mindful of my payment method at this point. Um, now, cashier, cash register picking is a little bit of a process for me. Um, I, I really, I don't pick my cash register based on the length of the line or, you know, the amount of groceries the folks in front of me have. I pick it based on who's going to be checking out my food. All right, that's important to me. Who specifically is going to be checking out my food? Now, I'm going to ask you not to judge me, OK? I really struggle with allowing my groceries to be rung up by some black men. I know that sounds funny. I know. It's, it's a little bit of a struggle for me, and you know, definitely some internalized stuff I got probably going on. But it's, it's an honest struggle, right? I, I struggle with allowing attractive black men who may be single, may like long walks on the beach, maybe in their like, you know, mid-30s, early 40s, you know. I, I really struggle with them ringing up my groceries. So I avoid that at all costs. Um, so instead of going to the attractive brother, you know, who's on one register, I go all the way to the end of the, the last register uh, where I see an older woman, um, who may be a grandmother. I feel like it's a safe bet for me. Um, and I you know, go to the register. And <clears throat> I, um, so I go to the register and you know, begin to add my, my groceries you know, onto, the, onto the cart, I mean, onto the, uh, the line. Um, and at this point, I'm also being mindful of you know, the amount of you know, the, the amount on my, on my card, on my, my EBT card, you know, the SNAP benefits. Um, I want to make sure that I have enough food stamps to cover the cost of all the groceries that I just got. Um, but I, I don't also want the people around me to kind of know that that's how I'm going to be kind of paying. Um, so anyway, I'm paying attention to the price, you know, and getting a little anxious as it rises and gets closer to, you know, the, you know the, the, the balance on my EBT card. And then, of course, you know, it comes up to more than on my EBT card. Um, so I, I panic for a moment, and then I remember I'm good. I'm actually good. I, I have my debit card with me, um, so I can pay the balance on that. So I know that I, I've done this before. I know the process, um, but I sometimes it doesn't work as well in certain grocery stores, so I decide, let me just tell the cashier, the cashier that I'm going to be paying um, this way. Um, so I, you know, quietly, you know, I kind of turn my back a little, you know. I, you know, I, I, I speak with her in a kind of firm but really soft voice, and I, you know, show her my EBT card. I'm, I'm going to be paying with my this card and then this card. I'm going to be using two methods. Um, and so, you know, I think I was speaking too low because she really couldn't hear me. So she's like, excuse me? And I'm like, oh, I got to say it again. So I, you know, say it again. I try to, you know, um, speak a little firmer, but definitely not louder. She hears me this time, thankfully. But then she's like, oh, you're going to pay with two cards. And I'm like, ah, you know. Um, so I'm like, yes. And I, you know, go ahead and I swipe my EBT card. Um, and I'm mindful, sometimes this doesn't work well in certain stores. This happens to be one of them, right? Um, what ends up happening is insufficient funds comes up. And I'm like, no! You know, in most stores, you know, you, you swipe the card. You know, it doesn't bother with the insufficient funds. It just kind of, it, it tells you you have another balance and you pay, you know, however you will. But not this store. So she says, ma'am? Uh, your card is declined, but she says it loud enough so everyone can hear. So I'm like, oh, man, here she goes. She throws me under the bus again. But now I'm watching the, the back of the line, and everybody's, like, starting to get a little weary. And, you know, folks are starting to move from the line, and it, I start to kind of panic a little bit. I'm remembering what it felt like when my kids were little, 
when they were small, and I was in the line with WIC checks um, to pay for you know some of my groceries, and people were kind of looking at me like I was some welfare queen or, or something, and kind of being judgmental and all that stuff. And I, so it just brought me back. So, you know, seeing all that, it, it feels a little traumatizing. But anyway, I, I pull it all together, have an exchange with the cashier. And she ends up letting me know that she needs to call for assistance. Um, you know, all the while, I'm kind of checking the scope, the scene. I'm looking at the attractive black male cashier, you know, making sure that he's not getting wind of, of things. But um, as she calls for help, you know, other people are starting to leave the line. And she raises her hand. And suddenly, the, the thing that, you know, I didn't want to happen happens that the attractive black man gets out of his seat because suddenly he doesn't have any customers anymore and he comes and walks over and I'm like, ah! Um, and at that point, things kind of happen in slow motion, right? You know, I'm like, oh gosh. You know, he instructs me what to do. You know, my, my mind kind of wanders and, you know, my body is just kind of like going through the motions. And and I think at that point, it's, it's sort of like I... I feel like I'm, I'm caught, you know, like I, I have to come clean on some things, you know, and, and in my mind is like, okay, okay, you got me, you got me. Yes, I was raised in the housing projects on government cheese and food stamps. Yep, yep. And we called them coupons because we were too ashamed. Yes, yes. I, 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 I was a free lunch kid. Yes, I was a free lunch kid, but I also went to college. Ivy League, Ivy League, okay? Yes, yes, I did raise my kids on, on, on food stamps, and I nourished them, and we made these wonderful, amazing meals, all on SNAP benefits. Yes, I, I did barbecues and cookouts and hosted family members, all on SNAP benefits. Yes, I am. I'm a professional woman, college educated, and my family still benefits from public assistance. And you know what? You know what? I, I kind of love it. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of good, and I'm tired of running away. I'm not a, you know, I'm tired of running away. And you know what? I'm not ashamed of it. And, and I'm going to do it again. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Let's give it up for both of our storytellers. This is so great. Uh, Misty, I loved the stress and anxiety and pain in your story. It was just so bittersweet and funny. And and um, so many of us can relate. I especially love this, the ending when you're, you're talking about that list that goes on. Yes, I was raised in housing projects on government cheese and free lunch, but I also went to the Ivy League and SNAP and all, you know, all those details. And then you kind of went to the part of like, I love it. I'm tired of running away and not ashamed. And you talked about like how you are a fighter for social justice, especially in your therapy work and um, that you see therapy as a healing process for overcoming systems. Could you talk more about this and how this personal story was healing for you? Absolutely. Um, and first off, thank you all, you know, thank you, Sage and, and everyone for inviting me here. Um, I will say it was, it was a bit of a process to, to write that story and to, to get the guts to tell it. Um, and I think part of what was happening there was, you know, just in that process um, was me coming to reckon with, you know, my own internalized, um, you know, ideas about receiving assistance and, and all of that stuff. Um, and all the anxieties, you know, that 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 come with it. Um, and so that was sort of that the story itself was a repre representation of it. But part of what it represented was my own little my own journey with um, coming to terms with me running away from those ideas of like the welfare queen and and things like that. Right. And, and those internalized ideas of, you know, pulling yourself Self up by the bootstraps and all of that, you know, that stuff. So um, I, it was definitely, I think a healing, a healing process, um, you know, part of my own healing journey. Um, and I'm really thankful um, to have that opportunity to do it. Um, yeah, I um, have done a lot of social justice work um, and I, you know, consider my current work as, as all part of that right like i think we live in 
a system that creates poverty, that creates need, right? And so, um, and that, that creates all of these in, injustices. Um, and I think it's been very important for me to be able to kind of fight, you know, against, you know, that, that system. And, and part of that is, I, I think, I, I see my, my work as, a th- as currently as a therapist, as supporting people, you know, to deal with the ways that they internalize, um, you know, systemic issues, like internalize ideas of, you know, living in poverty or internalizing needing assistance and, you know, all those, those things um, and, and supporting them on, on their healing journey. So yeah, this is this was definitely an interesting, um, you know, project for me, and I, I appreciate that I got to do it. Yeah, I would love to know since you're someone who goes to the grocery stores so regularly, um, what do you think grocery store cashiers should do to handle these personal transactions in a private way so it's not so traumatizing? And- um, you know, like we're in 2021, there should be an easier payment process. Is there anything that you yeah. thought? Um, I think, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, I think it's even bigger than the, the, the cashier, you know, I think it's, you know, the way, you know, the, the whole, the whole structure of it, you know, um, like having to, um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't exactly know how, you know, everything, you know, things could, could change per se, but I think part of it is just like the demonizing of people who use assistance, right? And just like all the stigma that, that comes with that. Um, and I, I think, you know, when, when people probably go and use their EBT card, right, there's certain looks that people get, you know, there's certain, you know, um, assumptions that are made, you know, about people. And so I think, I think that we need a lot of work on that, right? Because those are old tropes, old, you know, stereotypes that are sort of coming, um, coming to light and that we're interacting with regularly, right? Like that, that idea of the welfare queen, you know, that idea that, you know, we're less than if we're using public assistance and, you know, and, and all of that. Um, and also the racialized nature of it too, you know, like that, um, you yeah. know, yeah, the assumption that it's, you know, people of color that are mostly like using, you know, public assistance or needing that or abusing it, right? You know, that that's the idea. Um, so I think that's where the level of where the level of change needs to happen, I think. I, I think that that's such a great point. And I know that you've worked on that concept before of the welfare queen stereotype. I, I would love if you could talk more about how this trope haunts people, especially single mothers of color. Right. And in our exhibit, The Food for the People, it talked about how the food stamp program was created in 1939 during the Great Depression. And actually it was, um, mainly developed for like farmers and white people in that over 20 million Americans used it to, to buy groceries and stuff and fed folks. Um, but they, they were white and it um, was it was a lot of the domestic workers and folks who were African American were not eligible. And, um, they were actually, you know, really discriminated. It was actually the civil rights movement and black power. Yeah and other things that allowed for more of these Black communities and other communities to um, be able to use food stamps. And that the idea didn't come about till the the welfare queen, till like the Mm -hmm. 80s, right? And so it's such a, we may think of it as a long time ago, but it's a really new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'd love to know how you grappled with that because it's such a powerful concept. Yeah, yeah. The, I think the welfare queen um, stereotype is a very powerful and damaging concept, right? It it really, you know, it's that idea that, um, you know, the, the myth of the welfare, this idea that, that Black people, I mean, it, it gets racialized, right? You know, so when we think of, first of all, like when we think of like the welfare system or we think of public assistance, we automatically attach like black faces to that, right? Like, or, or you know, faces of color, you know, to that. Um, 
And so embedded in the idea of the welfare queen is this black woman, right, you know, who is abusing the system in some way, right, and, it, and underneath that is this idea that black people are lazy, right, and they, you know, basically want to rely on a system at the expense of taxpayers, right, taxpayer dollars, right. Um, and I think it's very damaging, right, it, it, it one, it, it demonizes people of color, demonizes women, black women, you know, in particular. Um, I think it also, it influences how I think our broad society views people and views assistance. Um, it impacts policies, right? Like how, you know, what policies get sort of made, you know, how the distribution of resources, right? Like what communities get what resources, what communities don't, you know, and all of that stuff. So it's it's damaging on so many levels. And then there's the the individual and the communal level where we hold the brunt of that, right? Like, you know, some of, I mean, it was a funny story about like me kind of traveling, you know, in a grocery store, but really like the, it's a story about the anxieties, right? That kind of come up as a result of this, right? The, the, the pieces, like, you know, those internalized, you know, ideas that, that we're constantly battling with and holding on our own laps, you know? Um, and I think what, what's been interesting is um, when I, I actually got to do some really great organizing work um, in my hometown, Providence, Rhode Island, um, and a shout out to DARE, Direct Action for Rights and Equality. Um, and part of our work was sort of like popular, you know, we did sort of popular education. We would support each other to learn about the systems, you know, that are impacting us. Um, and I got to lead a workshop um, around um, some economic justice efforts um, that took place and specifically got to learn about the welfare rights movement, um, which was led by a lot of black, um, you know, women of color who, you know, were barred from or needed more access to public assistance, right? And so even though black women, you know, basically were the face of public assistance, the reality was that that whole, you know, the, the um, TANF program, which was, I think, in the in the past, it was called um, something, I, I forget the name of, of the original name, but that program was really designed for white widowed women, right? And those are the women, those are the people who primarily benefited from, you know, from uh, that resource, um, even though um, black folks have sort of other have become the face of it as like abusing the system. Um, and so, you know, what we got to learn was that there was that they had to be a fight to there had to, people had to fight to actually gain access, you know, to these resources and for, you know, that um, it, for it to be expanded and for it to for the, some of the penalties surrounded by, you know, using the resources that they would be lessened. Um, and a lot of that work was around, was, you know, through, you know, the black power movement and, um, you know, specifically the welfare rights movement, which were black folks, you know, right on the front lines of that. Um, and so it was really interesting folks that were in that class, you know, a lot of, you know, which were, you know, black women and men were like shocked to like learn that, oh my goodness, like all this time, like we've been demonized and, you know, looked upon as the, in this particular way, but really this program, what, you know, was benefiting, it wasn't even benefiting us in, you know, um, in, in big ways. So it was, it was really interesting, you know, to learn that um, and that at the same time, you know, our communities are, um, you know, dealing with the with the with the issues and the brunt of you know of of this. So, yeah, it was, you know, good, interesting work. Yeah, I, I encourage people to come to the exhibit and to to really grapple with more of this in person, um, both inside and outside of the museum walls. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Misty. I know during grad school you also did Instacart, which is buying food for other families and um. And then bringing it to their door. Yeah. Was it to shop for other people? Was it as stressful and anxiety, um, or was it almost free? <laughs> the cost is an issue. <laughs> people who have to do that as additional income and right living, or is that also another place where people are sometimes exploited or 
Yeah, I, I think so it's like so much. I think it's like that's loaded in, in so many ways. But I, I think, um, yes, so I did, you know, during grad school and even after I graduated when I, you know, uh, was working, I did to supplement my income. I, I did Instacart um, and I chose that because I was like, well, I know how to shop real well, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm good at that. Right. You know, I do it multiple times a week for my own family, you know, so I, you know, I had a sense of, you know, I could, I could be pretty successful and quick at that. Um, you know, my kids may think differently, but, but um, I, yeah, it was, it was interesting. I think actually if, if I, I was thankful in many ways that that was an opportunity that I had to kind of supplement my income. But at the same time, it you have to really work a lot to make to make it worth it, right? And so I do feel like, you know, unfortunately, companies like that do exploit, you know, folks, you know, that are low income and that, you know, are in positions where they, they need to make extra money, right? Um, you know, you don't get paid that much, you know, to, to do, you know, a, a good amount of work. Um, and so I think for me, it was like, okay, this is something I know how to do pretty well. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, the critical part of me was like, this is, you know, as soon as I don't need to do this, I will not do this anymore, you know? Um, so, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't hate on, I think I don't hate on anyone that has to do that, you know? Um, and I, and I, and I get, you know, why, why that's a, you know, a benefit. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was a little, it was interesting. Um, it was definitely an interesting experience. Um, I think, you know, I think broadly this, this whole kind of experience, like reminded me that like how important it is to, to remember that, you know, we live in a society that we live in a, a society that creates the conditions for us to have, you know, the kinds of needs that we do, right? And so even though we may feel ashamed that we have to use public assistance or whatever, right? Like th it's not about, you know, you being lazy or you not wanting to work and, you know, all of that stuff, right? It's not about any of that. It's, it's a lot of this is, this is a, this, the social structure that, that we are in, right? And so, you know, I, I think, I think it's just important um, you know, just, just to remember that. And I think that helps to humble me, you know, when I'm feeling like ashamed and, you know, running away from this idea that, oh my goodness, I don't want to be considered a welfare queen or whatever, you know, even though I'm one of the people that's like fighting and working against that stuff. Like, I, I think it's important for us to just remember the, the larger, you know, systemic issues that create these conditions, right? Um, it's we, we value certain work and we don't value plenty of work, right? Like I'm a therapist and still had to use, you know, public assistance. What's up with that? Like what's up with that, you know, with that system, you know, um, or that maybe we all, you know, the other thing is that we all need assistance in some kind of way, right? And we all use it, right? We're not, no one's talking about like, you know, how the wealthy folks get tax cuts and, you know, things like that and how that's assistance, right? You know, that's another kind of, you know, food stamp or whatever, right? You know, we're, we're, we really demonize, you know, what's taking place among low-income folks, you know, um, and we're not looking broadly about, you know, assistance that we all actually need it and, you know, it, it's part of our way. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to, I know that we're running out of time. Yes. And I thank you. Um, but also that to, to mention what people are saying in the chat, that it also, um, the welfare queen trope stereotype came out during the war on drugs and Reagan and popularized the term and really made it to turn against black women and say that yeah. widespread fraud, but there, there wasn't. Um, and I, I would love to hear like your thoughts of, how you would like to see the the world change and if there's anything special kind of things you'd like to shout out in the DC area. I know those are big endings, <laughs> but I asked everyone about the shout outs and- Oh, the shout outs of food. Areas. Yeah, the food places. Maybe it's even like Groupon deals. I know that's something. <laughs> yeah, well, my kids now, they're like big on eat, um, eating, you know, vegan. And so I, we've loved new vegan. I'll, I'll say that that's in uh, PG County in College Park. So it's like a vegan soul food um, place. Also, we did get to um, go to Naja's Land of Kush, which is, uh, she was another storyteller um, out in Baltimore, um, her restaurant. 
Uh, we also just love Ethiopian food. We're in Silver Spring, and so we get to love up on on all the yummy Ethiopian food and we're big time into Vietnamese pho. And we, we enjoy some busboys and poets too sometimes. Um, so yeah. That's great. And yeah. Have, like closing thoughts of how um, we can reach out to you and Oh, so yes, please, everyone. Um, I am a co-host of podcast. If I can just do a little shout out for our podcast, um, Healing While Black um, podcast. And we just started season two. Um, and so we want to just welcome folks to come and listen. You can um, also follow us. So check out the Healing While Black podcast, uh, wherever you uh, listen to podcasts. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at HWB podcast. Um, or send an email at healingwhileblackpodcast at gmail.com. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to kind of end with the last words of our um, exhibition, Food for the People, um, where because I just find it so powerful and, and love seeing both you and Wilma that really like bring about this is that the current troubling state of our food system demands that we reimagine and remake it together. The land that produces our food is a resource worth nurturing. The workers who make our food possible from farm to table are worthy of living wages and safe working conditions. Our region's food, rich food traditions, the farmers and local Food businesses that sustain them are deserving of celebration and support. Access to affordable, healthy food need not be a luxury. The challenges are many and have been long in the making. Only through the collective power of community like Misty and Wilma um, might we be able to make a more just and sustainable food system. So I want to close like with all of us and to, to with you to really think about how you as in each of us as individuals can change the food system so it's more just and equitable. And if you had the power to shift our culture and make it less stigmatized, what would you do? Please tune in for this podcast series that's gonna come soon and make sure to sign up for our Anacostia community newsletter so you can have many other programs that are going on. Um, we have lots of great stuff even this week week um, with um, a, a workshop for Take Time Thursday tomorrow with local ACM educator and spoken word poet Dwayne Lawson Brown, who's doing a workshop called Right to Remember Self-Discovery Through Poetry. And you, reg you can register. It's from 2.30 to 3 for the free. Um, so it will be really <laughs> great. Uh, we just have it online here and um, yeah, I want to thank you both again for everything. And um, it has been such a pleasure to hear your stories and to share these important truths. So bye, everyone. I hope you have a great night. <laughs>